I am Oscar Ravi, creative director of Vertov. Vertov is a, is a spin on, spin, pun there, spin on uh, Giga Vertov, filmmaker, Russian filmmaker, which uh, some of you might remember from Mum with the movie camera. We're called Vertov we are without the E. Um, and in the next 19, and 50, 19 minutes, 50 seconds, I'm gonna show you my personal journey to move into VR and what we believe is the direction it, uh, it should take, at least from our corner of the, of the um, field. As you can tell from my accent, I am not from here. I am from uh, Chile in, the, in South America. I grew up in the desert. The Atacama Desert is the driest place on earth. And uh, you don't see many people there. The population is really uh, not dense. So you, you spend a lot of time on your own, either looking at your feet, because you have to walk for long distances, or looking at the landscape. That time that you spend on your own, it's something that stays with you when you are almost 40. Um, so my understanding of, of, the, of myself has a lot to do with understanding just myself, having aware, awareness of who I think I am, who I feel I am, and trying to um, leave the social awareness part of, of myself as a secondary way of understanding that, that existence. Nothing changes much in, in the Atacama Desert. You can see that the, the desert time is a time of its own. Hundreds of years can swing by and, uh, and many people can live by those years and nothing really appear to be changing much in the desert. The scale of things, you know, the mountains, the rocks, the dust, the roads that we build and, 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 and leave them there to decay, living in a, in a separate time scale to our own. So when I say that, that I, as well as all my schoolmates, used to walk long distances, we, we, we were thinking a lot of time on, on, on what that thing was, you know? How do we get to play with ourselves? How do we get to, you know, draw in, in the sand and make some sense out of that? Because the desert is way bigger than ourselves. My mom, my mother, is a math teacher, right? She, um, she loves her algebra. She teaches in primary school, and she hates her calculus. The difference between algebra and calculus is algebra is about coming, uh, coming up with clear answers and the rules that define those answers. Calculus instead is about describing change and the reality that that change describes. My mom hated calculus because of change. Yeah? For her, change is something bad. If something is changing, something if sh is shifting, she would be suspicious. If something is established and you can appreciate it as it is, then she can trust that. My way of understanding the world has a lot to do, like I said before, with my own perspective. And I know that my own perspective is constantly changing from big changes, which you're going to learn about that in, um, in a few slides, big uh, behavioral changes, cultural changes, you know, speaking English on a regular basis instead of my native Spanish, to small changes, you know, uh, looking this way, looking that way, appreciating this room, this angle, appreciating the people that are surrounding me the other way. Being aware of those small changes, the small scale, uh, the way my face changes, the way, the way my hairdo changes, the things that I'm wearing today, yeah, small changes compared to the time scale of changing my own personality, are things that I learned to appreciate because of that time that I spent on my own. And respect that my own perspective was something that was defining that personality. And on defining that personality, I was understanding how the world is. In virtual reality, which is my current practice, that first person point of view is crucial. We could have followed very different models. We could have think of, you know, states of, of mind which are not visual but you know, the, the, the chemical balance of your own body could be a way of understanding the world. 
But it seems that understanding your point of view would be a way of understanding how the world revolves and it's built around you. The same principle of the, the point of view, the first person point of view, is what we're living through today. And that has a, a, a long history. We can blame this dude, René Descartes, for, for making us think of you know, the first person point of view and that way is how you understand your place in the world, basically. You know, we could have been a, a being with many centers, but as ridiculous as the description sounds, even if I make it, if I bring it up in a, in a funny accent for you, that still doesn't prove logical, right? A center with many, uh, sorry, a, a, a being with many centers. We, have, we only have one center. And the best metaphor for that, the best, best aesthetic metaphor for that is the first person point of view. We can blame René Descartes for that, who coined in, 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 in his way of portraying this thing of where's my place in the world? This is where I am. This is my point of origin. If you can understand where you are, which is to say if you can understand how you fit in the world and how you recognize that you actually exist in the world, then you have a point of origin. That thing, you know, that notion, when, which he established in 1637, has come a long way to reach us in these sort of representations, right? 1992, we got to see and play and, and, and spend time, endless nights instead of studying, with Wolfenstein, Wolfenstein 3D. This game um, is the representation of a principle called raycasting. Raycasting is a computational technique in which, by the point of origin, the red dot that you're seeing there, you can reconstruct the illusion of a three-dimensional space. What ray casting does is it shoots a ray, an invisible ray, or you can make it visible, but it's a, it's a ray that is shot towards infinity. And when it touches an object in your 3D environment, it makes it visible. What that wants to say is that with the user through their avatar, in this case, you know, a red dot, where the user is paying attention, where the user is looking at, only that reality is rendered. Well, only that portion of the space is rendered. And by seeing where those things are, you know, where the environment, environment is, the elements of the environment that is, you can find reflectively, reflectively, yourself. So if you know that, that all the walls are surrounding you and there is a, there's a ceiling and there is a floor. By reflection, you can find that you are part of that environment and that environment is containing you. That principle is the one that um, we got from Descartes. And as you know, Cartesian thought is not just a philosophical set of notions, but also what inspired the understanding of our 3D environments. When we talk about access and, and the reconstruction or the construction of a 3D environment, we're using Cartesian thought. That is all to say, and I'm bringing it up, to say that you are the center of the world because of that you know, thread of, of tradition of, of uh, notions that we're putting into practice in virtual reality today. So talking about practice, let me show you my um, journey as a visual artist, because that's my, my tradition. Uh, in, South, in Chile, I used to be part of a, an artist collective in which we, we would play with you know, things not hanging on the wall, no volumetric things like sculptures, uh, no other things other than the things that you get to play when you're a starving artist. When you're a starving artist, you try to you know, gather material. And sometimes that material is no other than your own body. The moment that you put yourself in, a, in, a, in, an, uh, in an art space, whether that's a gallery, whether that's the living room of the place where, we, where our collective used to squat, live, um, that becomes an artistic you know, practice. So because we were living all together and we were you know, having lots of conversation about you know, simulation and Baudrillard and, and you know, Paul Virilio and Speed, that conversation that we all had in the 90s, we decided why don't we make this thing that is happening here in, in the art gallery. 
one of the pieces that was part of that production was called Living Karaoke, and it was our living room transported into an art gallery with that, do I have a cursor? Yes, with that, with a bubble. Inside that bubble, you could enter and you could sing karaoke with us or among ourselves as visitors. What we wanted to do is to invite people and, and kind of become us, be part of our reality, the way we were living it, um, one to one to say, so to say, so to speak. Um, so perhaps we can do that today. What do you mean, ah? Oh. <laughs> no, we're not going to sing karaoke, but this is the sort of, of karaoke videos that we were producing. <laughs> yeah, so that was in the background. All right, another series of, of work. No, that was quite level, quite, quite even. Another set of um, works that we did together was Yo Yu, in which we invited artists, of any practice, you know, painters, poets, um, performers, even the curators, to get in the ring and fight each other, right? <laughs> of course, you know, you, would, you could say that it takes some convincing to get in the ring and actually get punched or punch each other. But uh, as we all know, it's not too hard to convince people when you are in it constantly. So this was a, a, a constant flux of you know, moving from the audience and having fun there and having conversations, the same, same, same kind of conversations that we were having at the art gallery in our living room. Talking about relational networks, and how you know, we connect to each other in the highbrow conversation, it all get, got suspended when you get in the ring. So we did that series in, in three uh, cities in South America. It was quite in, in joyful um, for some. <laughs> and yeah, don't, don't, don't think for a second that I didn't do it myself. And every single time I was part of one of the, of the bouts, one of the fights because you know you need to do yourself what is that thing that's happening there in order to invite someone else more uh, furthermore the, the fights were uh, suggested suggested <laughs> were presented as uh, as programs the way that you have you would have a computer program so i would give this script that would look like a like a, a script from a play but it would be generic so so the way that you would describe variables in a program, so variable A equals some value, var variable B equals another value, it would be contender A, contender B, referee, and they would perform the program. When I arrived in Australia, um, a few years after I arrived, we created our company Vertov. Like I said before, Vertov is a spin on Ziga Vertov. And we're working only in interactive virtual reality. What interactive virtual reality is, uh, let's start with the definition of what it's not, but it is not. It is not 360 video. By its own nature and the proposition that we're putting forward, it is not linear because we want the user to be part of that narrative. And when I say narrative, it's not just, just a linear experience, not just putting the headset, I'm part of something, and then taking off the headset. But when I say narrative, I mean almost capital N narrative, is what is happening with the language. You know, we are trying to understand that the user is at the center of that thing that is happening, not um, explicitly, you know, on the screen and on, on your headphones, but implicitly on some sort of media history approach. We're doing that by making productions of virtual reality and also running workshops. So let me show you a VR workshop we ran uh, in 2015 in South Africa.
to HDMI. Sound to HDMI. Sorry for the lack of volume there, but what, what Jim was saying there, which is the point that I want to rescue from this video, is that you feel that you're one with the people. There's something funny there that we were all discovering in that workshop and that we keep discovering when we, when we try to put, to enforce, to force a narrative into VR. VR is by, if you don't do anything in VR, if you just start with, the, with a blank canvas, I'm calling it canvas because I want to trigger the, you know, the painting approach in, instead of the filmmaking approach. Put that as a side note. If you start with a blank space, an empty space, which is what you get when you open up and you fire up Unity, the game engine that we use, as opposed to Final Cut, when you start with a blank slate, you could just press play, put the headset on, and that becomes an experience, yeah? Becomes an experience that doesn't have a timeline. It could keep running, as long as you have the headset on, it would be running forever, for infinity, yeah? What we, we keep discovering is the minute that you put someone in a headset and put uh, in that blank space a cube, a sphere, any sort of three-dimensional primitive in front of them, there is a relationship with that environment. So when, when Jim says, it feels that you're one with people. We want to, I want to think, that people can also be um, translated or transcribed or, or, or mirrored into objects, into things, into the world. So the, the, the world is not just made up of people, but the world is also made up of objects. If you see the objects, I'm gonna go back to the first notion, if you see the objects around you, probably you can understand what your place in the world is out of reflection. Convoluted stuff. So what our work uh, has been doing is to try to explore that thing, that thing of how do you um, build this sense of identity, of personal identity, in a way that, that the environment is telling you who you are and what you can do in the space. You know, just what you can do in the three-dimensional space, but you can do what you can do in the narrative space. The purpose of it being that if you have that exercise if you have a successful exercise of that environment, of that proposition that I just described, when you take the headset off and you go back to being a normal citizen of the physical world, things that were presented to you in a narrative manner could be triggered again in everyday life. So with that in mind, I'm gonna talk about Ascent, which is a very personal story about my father a VR production that we did in 2013. <laughs> Ascent is a story about my father, who was an army officer and part of the military dictatorship in Chile, dictatorship that lasted from 1973 to 1981, 1989. In 1973, the, a month after the coup, there was a death squad roaming the country, making sure that everyone understood that things were serious. Serious not just for the civilians, but also for the officers. That, um, in October, my dad witnessed the mass execution of a group of prisoners. Fifteen prisoners got shot dead right in front of him. There was nothing he could do. In that moment, very short moment, just one morning, changed his whole life. Through that moment and through his life, that also changed the life of my whole family and my family as well. 
He sat me down one day when I was 16 and told me the story of that day. He described what he went through, what he felt, and that conversation started that day, but has never stopped. He has changed and changed. And at the beginning was a father telling his son, you know, these things are going to be important for you. I'm trying to protect you because you're going to be finding our name, you know, our family name on books, in the news. So that's, that conversation has been changing for over 20 years. Show us our, our days today to present day, in which it's more like two uh, grown men you know, sharing a beer trying to cope with the things that we, were, we got dealt with. Ascent is my interpretation of that conversation. It's not a forensic analysis of the execution itself. It's my relationship with my father. So I want, you to, uh, I want to highlight one tiny section of Ascent. Sweet. Where is it? Ascent, the way it's written, wants to drag you in, wants to put the wrapper of my dad's character. You become, you as a user, as a visitor, some, some people call the visitor to VR. As a user, you are wrapped in the character of my father. I'm treating you, because I'm part of the, of the story, as my father. And I'm projecting you the things that I'm, that I'm, that I'm actually telling my father. What that wants to do is to put you in the middle of, of that questioning. I don't have a, the, you know, I'm not presenting a, a, an, an authoritative version of the, of the facts, but I want to share with you that questioning that I have myself. What is the difference between my father and the soldiers that most people in Chile uh, associate with the dictatorship and with repression, with oppression, uh, with violations of human rights. I don't, I don't have clarity on that. So the center of my, my questioning is not in my emotions, it's not just within me, but it's shared between what I feel about my father and what the social space tells me that someone like my father might be for them. So I take that center out and try to understand what that is. Like I said before, there is no rational way of understanding a center of understand, a center of, of cognition that's away from your, your mind. And of course, as I'm saying the mind is not just the brain, right? Brain is, sorry, mind is myself and the extensions of myself. There is no center outside of, of that mind. So when we bring it back, that's what we try to do with virtual reality today. We want to put you into that exercise of, if you are the one at the center of the narrative, what happens? If you are the one carrying out those, you know, pulling those levers, making the mechanisms happen, that can only happen in an interactive space. And, and what that happens in terms of understanding your protagonism in a story is something that we keep exploring and moving and pushing forward. So in the same vein, last year we produced Easter Rising, a um, historical documentary made with the BBC that wanted to put you in the, uh, in the footsteps of Willie McNeve, a young uh, Irishman that lived through the main events of the Easter uprising that happened in Dub Dublin that um, started the process of independence from the UK. There are certain actions that happened through the story that we wanted you to trigger. If we show you, you know, inside a frame what happens in a story, there is this cognitive detachment, this critical distance in which you can judge what happened to Willie McNeil. But if you happen to do at least you know, certain touch points with his actions, there is a chance that you will be understanding his being, you know, his 
thought process through a different, uh, with a different cognitive mechanism. So let me show you, because it sounds highbrow, but when you put it to practice, it's as simple as this. God, yeah. We are in the first few years, the first the few first years of um, the nascent language of VR. We really don't know what is a you know um, a jump cut, what is a, a um, Ellipsis. I, I don't want to only bring it to, to filmmaking tropes, but yeah, we don't know what is a jump cut and an, an ellipsis yet. You know, we, we have the, the kind of the background notions of what they are as figures of speech, as literary figures, as literary tropes, but we have not developed the nuances of that yet. So what I'm saying is that all the discourses that I presented earlier, in the end, becomes a small gesture inside an interactive piece, which is to connect the virtual camera with the shadow of your, your character, to make you feel that you are there. That would be a visual representation of how we're pushing you to think, that's me, you know? That me, that, that, that object there is the extension of myself. When, I, when I'm saying extension, I'm just regurgitating Marshall McLuhan, right? So that one there is an extension of my presence. That would be a visual representation of this process. There are invisible uh, representations of this same notion. When you look to the side, there is a gun there. You need to be looking at it for the character to pick it up. If you don't pick it up, then the next action won't happen. The next action is that you're gonna be breaking down the door. Again, you need to be looking at the door for that sequence to be finalized in the um, breaking down the door, and that means that all your mates will be able to escape the building with you. All right, cool. That sequence of events are small things that we were n would not be able to call tropes yet, but somehow want to go there, want to bring up that um, capacity, you know, the affordance of an interactive medium of making your actions have a narrative weight Right, so talking about language, um, one thing that, that's kind of good to consider, uh, just like we were talking about um, you know, how you, you understand the sense of, of your presence and where you sit in the world, your place in the world, it might be good to, have a, um, to check the notion of duration by Henri Bergson which is not based in space, like I said at the beginning. This one is based in time. So duration for Bergson is an imaginary amount of time that we take into consideration to understand someone, you know, someone's thought process, someone's presence, someone's relationship with something or someone else. When we start thinking in, in terms of the time that we take to understand what someone is doing, what the presence of someone is about, there's, a, again, a different cognitive mechanism. And I think VR, because it's a moving image in the end of moving spaces, uh, medium, 
tends to bring that element of time again as a, as a, as a you know, foundational stream. So on the thing of time, in Spanish, and I'm wrapping up with this, in Spanish, the, the verb to be has two versions, and some, might, some of you might be familiar with this. The two ver versions are ser, which is kind of a constant state, a sustained state, and estar, which is a particular state. The root of that is the same as state, estar. But given all the, you know, the language of, uh, that we can borrow from, you know, theater and filmmaking and physical performance, sometimes language is just not enough. And that's what we're trying to find out. That's what we're trying to sort out with this small piece, of small experiment. And I'm going to leave you with a poem, which is kind of a, an old school karaoke. It's called The Imaginary Man by Nicanor Parra, Chilean poet. El hombre imaginario vive en una mansión imaginaria rodeada de árboles imaginarios a la orilla de un río imaginario. De los muros que son imaginarios penden antiguos cuadros imaginarios, irreparables grietas imaginarias que representan hechos imaginarios, ocurridos en mundos imaginarios, en lugares y tiempos imaginarios. Todas las tardes imaginarias, sube las escaleras imaginarias y se asoma al balcón imaginario a mirar el paisaje imaginario que consiste en un valle imaginario circundado de cerros imaginarios. Sombras imaginarias vienen por el camino, entonando canciones imaginarias a la muerte del sol imaginario. Y en las noches de luna imaginaria, sueña con la mujer imaginaria que le brindó su amor imaginario. Vuelve a sentir ese mismo dolor, ese mismo placer imaginario y vuelve a palpitar el corazón del hombre imaginario. That's it. Thank you.